Welcome to the In My Opinion Show with Ronald Barry Robinson and friends. We have a spectacular panel with us this evening. We have Miss Osha Weaver. Hello, Ron. Hi. We have Miss Tracy Blackwell. Hello, Ron. And we have Mr. <coughs> Henry Hatter. Good evening, Ron. Welcome all to the In My Opinion Show. Let's talk about the automotive industry. Here we go again. When the hell left the gate open? Government again bails out more for profit institutions. The automobile companies to the tune of seventeen point four billion dollars. I would not have given them shit either. Uh, GM is el eligible for loans up to thirteen point four billion and Chrysler four billion. And guess what? The auto worker is again asked to sacrifice. They want parity with the foreign auto workers. What most people don't know is is the government gave these same foreign auto automakers that produce cars in America a $4 billion loan and other incentives, incentives to build cars in the United States. Is the government trying to bust the unions out of existence? Is a revolution at hand? In these loans, the government gets 20% of the value of the loans and warranties. The company's stock is socialism taking over. The question is, who is bailing out or even trying to, to help the millions of everyday workers that work hard and play by the rules? that have lost almost everything because of the car companies, mismanagement, greed, unfair foreign trade deals, policies, and outsourcing of jobs. The answer is nobody. And when you do ask for help and are suffering financially because of circumstances beyond your control as a direct result of incompetence, you get absolutely nothing. It's a revolution at hand. Mr. Hedder, what is your thoughts? Well, Rod, <coughs> I am uh, very disappointed with the automobile industry in many, many ways, and I think it deserves uh, some criticism uh, that you've indicated. But by the same token, I do believe that it is businesses that build national capital. You've got to have your businesses. Without that, you would have no capital-making uh, uh, desire or provision or methodology to create national wealth. Uh, the automobile industry has created the, the standards for wealth for many, many years. We've all benefited by it. In this particular case, I do believe <coughs> that the automobile industry bears some guilt for what we find uh, mm -hmm. themselves in t today. Uh, back in the 60s, when we had the first introduction of the foreign Automobile, which I believe was Toyota. Was it the Renault? No, it was the Toyota. It was a Corvair? Oh, no. <laughs> it was Vessel. No, hang on. Okay. Let me make my point here. No. And I know that many people who work at General Motors probably may understand this and they may not, but hopefully they will pick up some things that they can agree with here. But when those first automobiles began to rise, General Motors had 57% of the uh, American automobile marketplace. Mm -hmm. And and as they continued to pour these cars in, uh, the market didn't expand at all, mm -hmm. but we lost market share. But yet General Motors' profits went up. Now why? It, you know, uh, profits are built on the number of units you sell. If you, you, that's in your business. You sell so many books, you earn so much profit. But that's the way businesses in h hardware or uh, um, manufacturing earn their profits. And over the years, the profits continue to rise. The market share continue to decline. Now, what was going on? And institutions missed it. The press missed it. And what they were doing is selling off the assets. Mm -hmm. And they first of all began to sell off, I believe, um, <coughs> the first one was the Frigidaire, if you recall. And then they sold off Central Technology, they sold off uh, uh, Detroit Diesel, um, Detroit Ball Bearing, uh, Central Technology, Delta Rumi, and more recently, in 2006, I believe they spun off AC or Delphi. 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 <coughs> now, in 2008, if you ran a model like the Japanese did, they could predict a year in which the, uh, we would have a clashing of uh, forces within the automobile industry. It had nothing else to sell. And so it collapsed. And they said, quickly, you've got to bail us out. 
but that was not all of the problems that happened. Let's look at the other side of what happened. We have Americans who work for the automobile industry. We have doctors and lawyers who buy foreign products, who should be buying the American-made products. And those people helped to create a demand for those foreign products. We're in a free market, and they, Americans can make their choices. They're as guilty as are the GM uh, people at the top who got great bonuses and deceived the American people and they deceived the workforce. And uh, so don't walk away thinking that you're absolved from guilt because we all had it. You, you, if you go anywhere outside of Michigan and you move around the country, you will find out that we don't see GM cars or Ford or Chrysler. <laughs> we see only foreign cars. And yet people are insensitive to the, the bailout. And besides, General Motors is not asking for a bailout. What it's asking for is a bridge loan. There's a difference between a bridge loan and a bailout. The bailout, you do take government funds and you shore up some financial situation. But what they're asking for is a bridge loan. A bridge loan mm -hmm. is generally uh, money that's, uh, that's uh, issued by the government with the intent that you would pay it back. But because of its risk, it's very much more expensive. So what General Motors is at and Ford and Chrysler are asking for is a bridge loan. Now, whether that's going to be enough money to bail them out, it's up to you to guess. But th they have been this in this fix in the past, and more than likely they will recover from it. But we ought to hope that they do recover. It's one of the last vestiges of manufacturing that we have <coughs> in this country. We need to save it um, because that is where the bulk of the wealth is made, and that will take and transfer gold from companies, countries abroad back to the United States. Mm. There's an imbalance right now because much of the stuff we purchase from other countries. We need to reestablish the balance there, and we need to do it through manufacturing, either the manufacturing of consumer goods or through services or through intelligence, um, um, artificial intelligence or entertainment. Those are products that we need that we still hold our own on. But we do need to save the automobile industry. Thank you. Change oh, by the way, let me, let me just say this. I forgot to say this. <coughs> Let's look at all the bailouts that we've had in the past and find out what happened. You know, back in the 70s, we had a uh, Penn Central went bust. And the United States did bail them out. Um, well, it, it was a bridge loan. And they paid that loan back a dividend. Mm -hmm. And then there were uh, other places like Lockheed Aircraft, and they paid theirs back, okay? Franklin National Bank did. SNL was one of those who did, but I went to boom. They didn't pay theirs back. Chrysler paid its, its uh, loans back. So uh, in the airline industry, did, um, they didn't pay it all back, and they went bankrupt, of course. Mm -hmm. You know that. Mm -hmm. But there are many people who say, well, General Motors will fail because they all fail. But that's not true. The history well shows that they are capable of paying this back if they are positioned well. And I don't know whether we have enough money to quite do that. We may have to go back again to the coffers and the ashtrays. Mm -hmm. Tracy, <coughs> what is your thoughts? Um, yeah, I do believe that they're going to need significantly more than they were they received in the first payment. Um, my question is is similar to the financial um, bailout loans that we provided to the financial institutions. Um, if your business model is flawed, um, we as regular business owners don't get any, uh, uh, we can't go to the government and ask for a loan while we try and figure out our flawed business model. Um, and I wonder if General Motors is going to be able to um, really look at itself, scrutinize itself and what it's doing and be able to build its product up, um, mm -hmm. look at the way that it's going to be able to employ the new generation of, of, of employees, and then uh, look at its administrative level, the designers, the CEOs, the financial people who m either make decisions to make profits or sell off assets um, and decide how it can be a profitable, bi profit profitable business. Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the things I think about is the lobbyists and all the money that lobbyists make. And they make a lot of money to go down to Washington and say either keep things the way they are so we can continue to operate the way we operate or change the rules so that we can continue to operate the way we operate. Mm -hmm. And they paid a lot of money to lobbyists so that they could continue to be exactly how they were and have fuel cars that weren't as fuel efficient as they could have been and things like that. And that's what you know people are really begging for now. Um, and really what they wanted to do is status quo. And so they, it, I, I don't know if a company can want to be status quo, hold on to being status quo so long, and then now want to be able to really scrutinize itself and become basically a different company is what the oversight committees for the um, federal government are asking is that they, you know, really change who they are. Henry, I have a question for you. Uh, as an engineer, uh, what went wrong with the automobile industry, uh, especially as it relates to uh, fuel efficiency? They knew that, uh, uh, you know, there's only so much natural resource in terms of oil, you know. Uh, they knew this 30 years ago. Uh, 40 years ago, uh, how did they drop the ball? Well, they dropped it uh, <coughs> by choice, uh, Ron. Uh, back in 2001, as you know, I had, uh, I had written a letter to the editor uh, indicating that uh, Congress needed to pass corporate daily fuel economy standards, which would move the standard from 27.5 miles per gallon to 33.5 miles per gallon. The argument was uh, from General Motors and uh, not only General Motors, from the automobile <coughs> industry and uh, <coughs> the unions that if we were to uh, retool at this time, it would cost the corporation billions of dollars, uh, both in <coughs> design and in lost wages and so on. So they were able to uh, get Congress to waive the passing of the corporate average fuel economy standard. More lobbyists, I <coughs> suppose. Well, not just lobbyists, but the, the press also took the position that uh, they needed to waive these. So what we have left now <coughs> are, are rudiments of, uh, of an industry that has been left behind, mm -hmm. left itself behind. Right, it did. But I said in that same letter to the editor, if we fail, if gasoline rose to $2 a gallon, it would virtually kill the American automobile industry. Mm. Should I say more? Mm -hmm. Well, that's... You can go back and read... Mm -hmm. That's what happened. Exactly what happened. Yeah. When it went to $4, people stopped buying big cars. Mm -hmm. The thing I think about, though... Um, I'm just shocked and amazed. Um, I start looking at the uh, sale prices for cars lately. And, uh, you know, I'm an average car buyer. But when I see $55,000 for a Cadillac truck, you know, when you talked about why were they making profits and, 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 and uh, you know, they were losing market share, I thought you were going to say because they started charging more for the cars. Um, but when I think about somebody spending $56,000 on a Cadillac truck compared to back in 1988, remember when they were s w encouraging us to spend 13000 on a Cadillac Cimarron? You know, that mm -hmm. looked like a <laughs> Cavalier or <laughs> something. Do you remember those yeah, Cimarron? I, I do. No. So, um, you know, the thought is, is that this, is to me, is, again, them. Um, it's like warmed over garbage. Um, it's the same old stuff. You know, and they're, they're, they are marketing what they have and telling us that this is what you really want, this is what you should have, and this is what's going to make you look cool and successful. And we're going, okay, we don't see anything else. This must be it. This must, so we, we buy that stuff when, in fact, people are looking for other alternatives. The other thing I heard, and I wonder if you know anything about this, Henry, is the, <coughs> the hybrid car, um, the Toyota hybrid, um, the uh, General Motors Bolt? What's the name of the um, Toyota hybrid? I'm trying to think of it. Well, anyway, they're about to close it. The pre, uh, pr 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 Prius? Prism? No. Oh. 
No, I, I know what Prius, Prius. is. Yep. They're about to close that down because they're not making any money yeah. with that. And the understanding is these hybrid cars are so much more expensive, supposedly, because you're going to save money in the back end with the fuel mileage. So we really do have to figure that out. But I have to admit, I am looking forward to the vault and when that comes out and what that's going to look like and how that's going to perform. But, you know, what I can't understand is, is that how in the world, in good conscience, do these uh, automobile industries think that the that the, that the average American can 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 afford this with you know with you know with the, with the outsourcing and the wage reductions and 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 the massive layoffs because uh, they have encouraged people and I've heard people say that how like like Henry says if I'm supposed to support my country how is it that I can um, go out and buy a used car I need to buy a new car in order for people to have jobs. Whereas w if you really think about people who are now getting financially educated and economically literate, the understanding is why would you spend 25% of, of uh, the cost of your home? Why don't you just put that money into your home to get closer to owning your own home? And some people will go, well, you're always going to have a car payment. That's not true. And I think that's what it is, is they're convincing us, <coughs> or they have convinced us, that if I don't care if the car is $32,000. I need a car, and that's how much cars cost, and that's what I'm going to pay for. As opposed to saying, "Let me wait three years and get that car for fifteen thousand, or or something like that." So you can have reliable transportation. But people believe that they need to be buying new cars. They believe they 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 should and deserve expensive cars. And well, also, too, sense. what is not shared, I don't think, with the American public is is that, you know, Chrysler's, Ford's, and General Motors, they're they're making profits overseas. Right. Okay. Now, what they don't tell them in their perspectives and stuff, the American people, how much profits that they've made in China and Taiwan, okay, and Mexico. But it's not enough okay. to sustain you know, the U.S. portion of the business. But, but, but whose fault is that? I <laughs> think, would you say that General Motor cars are more a status symbol in other countries? And it's not a status symbol here. You know, it's just your grandma's car. It's your great daddy's car, you know? Well, I don't know what status, uh, but you look for it. I belong to the automobile industry, so we produce things that people want. Mm. Uh, if people want it, we live in a big, huge country, and it takes us a long time to go from east to west and north to south. So mm -hmm. we need bigger capacity cars to do all of that. How do you need a big car to go the same distance that a long. small car would go? It takes, you're going to be sitting in a car for 15, 16 hours. Oh, so it needs to be a bed and a couch yeah. at the but same time. You've got to have a much, you've got to be able to move your legs. Mm -hmm. Americans yeah. are bigger people. Mm -hmm. They need bigger cars. Uh, that's my uh, two cents worth for there. But I want to say something about uh, your anticipation for small hybrid cars and electric car. Well... I believe that General Motors and Ford and Chrysler can do this, but it's uh, it's not a solution mm. to the problems that we face. Because if you're going to use an electric car, you're going to get your energy from coal conversion. You're going to, and there, in making the coal conversion from that type of energy, chemical energy to electrical energy, there is a 25 percent loss just in the conversion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're going to be using fossil fuels anyway because uh, somebody has to generate the electricity. Unless, of course, you go to atomic energy and then we're not there yet. So I don't see this uh, electric car that you have so much hope in at the vault. And, and I know that it would be good for runabouts in the city, but uh, you wouldn't want to trust it in going from here to Detroit because you run out of power. So are you saying, are you saying... That well, it's supposed to go 35 miles to a gallon. No, but... Not 35, but 35 or 45 miles charge. to a gallon. Yeah. Yeah. Charge, right? Uh-huh. That'll get me to Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so are but, you... But look at it. Okay. We're, we're, we're talking, we're not talking apples and apples. We're mm -hmm. talking apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. And there is a real huge uh, uh, energy conversion and loss there that will not sustain our economy. And mm -hmm. we're talking about the automobile industry duping the American public again. Well, I'm not so sure it's it's duping. Americans want so many things. They want they want environmental restraint. They want to reduce the carbon emission. They want to reduce 
nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide and all of those things that cause us problems with the environment they want to have all of it at once and in doing that you're going to have to sacrifice something what would you suggest if you could to make this to make this workable ok in terms of fuel efficiency if you were you know if you if you if you were in charge and you have complete control oh well first of all i would encourage people to use the mass transit system to carry more people at a time from point a to point b then i would encourage people to ride only when they have to to reduce our dependency on foreign oil because even if we grow uh billions of acres of corn and converted back to uh, gasoline or gasol if you will or uh, ethanol which mm -hmm. uh, propels the car you would have an energy conversion now fossil fuels has 18,000 BTUs per pound of gasoline mm -hmm. diesel fuel has 22,000 pounds but yet I mean 22,000 um, BTUs per pound and now when you when you take alcohol and ethanol it has 13,000 BTUs per pound mm -hmm. so you see the conversion there we're, uh, you're going to have to build a tank on your car to drive with alcohol that's uh, 25% bigger mm -hmm. just to get the same miles so you've got a 500 mile range you're going to have to have a bigger tank because the energy and alcohol is not there that's in hydro cars Okay. Quickly, there's one thing that I would like to say about the question that you asked before um, addressing uh, who is going to buy these cars, you know, um, being that they're sending their outsourcing jobs overseas into other countries. I wanted to say that there should be, um, I believe there should be stipulations on General Motors getting this money. Stipulations saying that, well, if we loan you this money, you're going to put the money back into the American economy, help revitalize the American con economy, because that is a concern of a lot of people, you know, a lot of plants closing down as a result, a lot of people losing jobs, and then a lot of the jobs are outsourced to other countries because you claim that, you know, the, our labor is too expensive, so we need to do it for cheaper labor. Um, the price of the cars are not reflecting the cheaper labor. So General Motors definitely should be, um, there should be stipulations on getting that money as far as keeping the money in America and using it to create more jobs for mm -hmm. the American people to keep the economy alive, to help it continue to, str uh, to thrive. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But you know what's wrong with that? <coughs> a, a great thought. Many people think about that all the time. Many people in the union, many uh, people who are on the salary think about only looking at the American thing. But we can't do that. It's we American have, money. We have to, but if the market, you have to support the market that supports your product. <coughs> the American the American marketplace does not support necessarily the American product. Well, let him go get his money from the foreigners then. Well, all you have to do is go into Walmart and find how many pr pieces uh, consumer goods you find built in this country. Right. Zero. Uh, well, well, close to zero. <laughs> <coughs> but now, how many Americans actually buy American automobiles? Is it one out of ten? Is it two out of ten? But it's no more than that. Has it so been now that why? Way? No, no, it wasn't that always that. Americans back in the fifties and the sixties and the seventies, they built eighty-five percent of the the consumer goods mm -hmm. for the world. Mm -hmm. But we've lost that. We lost it through a lot of means. It's a, it's a complex formula that explains how we lost. Uh, Manufacturing and, man and manufacturing is supposed to be one of the biggest, best businesses with, you know, uh, profit margin. Mm -hmm. um, that's why a lot of people in manufacturing do so well, but mm -hmm. because of, I think, sending, you know, uh, reduction in scale and sending things overseas, mm -hmm. we've lost the benefit of that. Because if you have a manufacturing plant, 
you're hiring more, much more than people who are on the line. You're, you, you have your administrators as well as your CEOs and things like that. So that's how people can build a mid, how we can build a middle class in America. But when we lost that, that's what we lost as well. At this time, though, we we must uh, uh, introduce our wonderful co-host, Miss uh, Tracy, Ac Miss excuse me, Tracy Atkinson Blackwell. Right. All right. Uh, owner of Pages Bookstore in Flint. Uh, Tell our viewing audience uh, about your uh, about your bookstore. Well, thank you, Ron. Pages Bookstore is located in beautiful, wonderful downtown Flint. The whole reason for opening it was so that we could have our own bookstore right here in the city of, of Flint, in the heart of town. And what we would like to accomplish there is just to create a community space, help build literacy, help people have a love for, for downtown and being a part of its revitalization. Um, we have books there. We kind of specialize in uh, uh, religious books, African-American titles, fiction. Um, our book clubs do very well. Um, one of the things I've um, always wanted to do, and I'm glad I'll be able to do it through your venue, the In My Opinion show, is to have a discussion about uh, a book like Books of the Month or must-read books. Like, for example, for me, I think a must-read book is a Audacity of Hope. That one is flying off the bookshelves. I'm glad to see a lot of people gave that as gifts um, this past season. And then also um, for us to start thinking about how it is that we can be a part of the solution with our economy is the Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And it really gets us to believe in that. If I think better, I'll see better, and I'll do better. That's wonderful. I thank want to you, thank Ron. our wonderful panel, uh, Ms. Uh, Osha Weaver, Ms. Tracy Blackwell, Mr. Henry Hatter. This is Ronald Barry Robinson and friends saying for the In My Opinion Show.